Politics in South Texas is heating up, y'all. 28-year-old progressive Jessica Cisneros is bringing all the smoke for the second time to challenge sitting Congressman Henry Quaylar for the state's 28th congressional district. Listen to this. Now we're back to finish what we started, to do what my dad taught me. Work hard, keep at it, y enseñar que la esperanza nunca muere. Over the past year, our community has suffered through this pandemic, waking up day after day, praying we wouldn't lose another family member or our jobs. And when we thought Congress would be the answer to our prayers, they ignored us. Apart from being a brilliant human rights and immigrant attorney, the young Latina turned heads in the 2020 election cycle when she almost unseated the veteran incumbent who's represented the district since 2005. She came within four percentage points, or less than 2,700 votes, of beating the moderate uh, Democrat, known to rub elbows, by the way, with Republicans, and to take campaign cash from big oil and gas and even private prisons. In the two years since losing to Quaylar, Cisneros took stock of how the constituents of her district haven't fared much better under him. From job scarcity to woeful access to health care and, of course, addressing the coronavirus, she sees gaps left unfilled and is confident that she can be the one to fill them. Here to tell us how she plans on winning this time around, putting forward a progressive platform, is Jessica Cisneros herself. Jessica, welcome to Amplified. It's good to have you here. Now tell us, why are you challenging Quaylar in the Democratic primary a second time around? Of course. I mean, it really much is because of the reasons why we decided to launch our campaign last time. Thank you so much for allowing me to share that story because as we spoke about at length um, during our race last time, especially being from the border, born and raised, especially under the past four years under the Trump administration, it seems like the border you know, is very much talked about, but you never really hear from us. Um, I decided to run again to honor all the work and commitment that our volunteers and voters put behind this campaign. Um, I was a 26-year-old first-time candidate. Not a lot of people had heard about me because I was so young. Um, and we're able to earn 48.2% of the vote in our first race. And that was thanks to all the hard work and support that people gave us, not just within our district, but across the country. And we're running, um, I mean, part of the reason why is because there's a lot of work left unfinished, right? We want to win because, especially in the past couple of years during the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of the crises that we were already experiencing in the district, including such a high rate of people that don't have health insurance um, here on the border. A lot of us have to go to Mexico to get cheap, um, cheaper health care than it would be here in the United States. A lot of people have to work two or three jobs just to make ends meet. Um, the poverty rate is still at a 30 percent here in my hometown. There's a lot that we need to address. So we decided to give it another chance mm. because we came so close and we know that we can win this time. In an interview with Texas Tribune, you said, quote, I think a lot of folks saw themselves reflected in the campaign last cycle. And even though we did come up a little bit short, I feel like a lot of South Texans were left with hope. So tell us, what did you bring to the table that spoke to people in 2020? And how will your message uh, be different this year? I mean, a lot of people were left with hope because I don't think, I mean, even some of our stronger supporters, right? Like, we knew we had an ear to the ground, but I think it's very, very validating to be able to put in a number and be like, look, we earned 48.2% of the vote. We knew this was going to be such a, an uphill battle since we are running against an entrenched incumbent, somebody that has been in office longer than I've been alive, um, since, you know, Boyad has been a representative here in Laredo much longer than the 15 years that he's been in Congress. Um, so for, for us to be able to take someone on that is that entrenched, someone that has, you know, millions of dollars at their disposal in the work war chest, um, powered by the Coke network, powered by the private prison industry, big oil, the NRA, I mean, any bad guy you can name, like he's getting money from them. Um, so for our community to come together and almost topple an incumbent, very much David versus Goliath style, I mean, it was so invigorating for people. Mm. And that's why whenever I was out, you know, in the few times going to the grocery store where people would recognize me during this pandemic, people were like, 
you owe it to us for another shot. You need to run again and make sure that you be mm. beat the guy this time. I'm curious uh, how the party politics are playing out here. Now, we have seen some very high-profile races uh, over the last few cycles where you've had Democratic challengers topple very, you know, old-school, entrenched even members of leadership uh, in the House so that, you know, they're, they're saying their argument is we got to get rid of the old folks who aren't serving the people, and you have progressive warriors that are that are unseating entrenched Democrats. I'm, I'm curious, um, how are you being received? Received from a, a party apparatus, uh, who are some of the folks that are supporting you, and who are you fashioning yourself yourself after? I mean, I'm really proud to be able to bring together a very large coalition of people. Um, we do have, well, given the fact that Cuellar also isn't very much of a friend to Democratic um, policy and um, is known to be a key vote um, or no, is known to be a reliable vote on key democratic legislation like for example most recently we saw it with him being the only democrat to vote against the women's health protection act was, which was just shocking for us here in texas because we had just seen the enactment of senate bill 8 which is the bounty hunter abortion ban um, at six weeks here in texas so for him to be the only one to turn his back on his own constituents in terms of having access to health care, I mean, it was shocking. That didn't earn him any favors. The fact that he's doubling down on his anti-labor stances, that also didn't, you know, um, earn him any favors with the labor unions, um, where the PRO Act is such a key piece of mm. labor legislation, and he was the only Democrat to vote against it twice. Um, those folks are standing behind our campaign because, I mean, it shouldn't be right that just because you have a D next to your name on the ballot, um, you can reap, you know, the benefits of what it means to be or having folks elect you because this is a reliably Democratic district. Mm -hmm. So we have the support of folks I'm interested, like Emily yeah. Sliss. Uh -huh. Sorry, go ahead. So, so this is a reliable Democratic district, and I am interested in getting into kind of a sense of, of the, the landscape that you're running in. A poll taken late last year found support for Quaylar's reelection is at 27 percent among general election voters and only 37 percent among Democratic primary voters. So I am curious, in this actual Democratic district, doesn't sound like a lot of people like them. So what can you tell us, you know, about what that says for the appetite for change among voters that are in that district yes i mean we we're hearing it at the doors we're hearing it at the doors and on the phones that people do want change and for us i mean part of the work that we're doing as a campaign is let people know that for the first time in over 15 years there is um someone else that's on the ballot and that was a big part of the legwork we did last cycle um, because I started off as someone with zero name ID and it was a huge hurdle to overcome in addition to, I mean, being a first time candidate, it's a very big learning curve. Um, so I think we did a really good job. We set ourselves up for a good second run and folks are so excited, you know, to know like, oh yes, I remember you from last cycle. I knew you came so, I heard that you came so close to defeating Cuellar. Um, I'm really interested in hearing about what you have to offer, and then we're able to quickly turn those folks into very strong supporters of our campaign. Mm. So before I before I let you go, I want to get your thoughts on redistricting. It looks like, you know, from what I'm seeing, it is likely that your district is going to be, you know, still Democratic, uh, might get a little bit bluer, but you're in the state of Texas and redistricting is front and center. So give us a sense of what you might do uh, when elected to really tackle a lot of the nefarious stuff that's going on there. Yes, I think especially, you know, being able to have the honor to represent the South Texas district where we saw that there were uh, Republican gains in the lower part of um, South Texas, not exactly our district, but other areas. Um, there's work that we can do to make sure that we are electing Democrats up and down the, ba the ballot that are actually going to be reflective of our democratic progressive values. Um, one of the problems that we had as to why, you know, there was an uptick on support for Republicans was because, you know, people kept, you know, being a little bit dispirited of having to vote for the same kind of people on the ballot because there were no challenges happening, right? Um, so for us, mm. it's talking about, you know, policies that meet the moment and then doing our part 
in spending, you know, in electoral infrastructure to make sure that we're reaching those voters um, and making sure that we're turning them mm -hmm. out. And that is going to be the pathway to turning Texas blue in the future. All right, Jessica Cisneros, Democratic candidate for Congress in Texas. Thank you so much for sharing with us tonight on Amplified and good luck.